Welcome to a, another live session. Um, and I guess it's Brand Cooper. Hi, Brand. Hi. And you've gone a long way uh, to get uh, to get here physically, which is for yes. what, uh, you didn't come only for the webinar. So, uh, but where did you come from? So uh, I flew in this morning from San Diego. And how's jet lag? Uh, it's just about ready to hit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so we need another forty minutes of your yeah. attention, and then actually I. I do care uh, afterwards as well. There's a, there's quite a plethora of things that Paul um, pulled together. Like uh, you did meet a couple of people today, then there's yep. something tomorrow, and We're then the weekend is something. Yeah, dinner tonight. Tell us. Yeah, dinner tonight. Uh, workshop all day tomorrow. Teaching some empathy experiments and using evidence to make decisions for both startups and large enterprises that are trying to build internal startups. Mm -hmm. uh, day after uh, X Camp begins. So that's uh, an unconference, essentially, uh, where we'll talk about uh, design thinking, agile, and lead startup. And, and I'll give a keynote there, and then uh, maybe do a session in there, depending on you know whether that'll uh, fit well with what, what others are, are participating in. I assume that people will swamp you with questions. And, uh, well, we'll see. So um, if you're from Germany, which is not that unlikely, as we are in Germany right now, um, uh, Brand is one of the leading, or thought leaders is probably the term that people uh, would use, about um, lean innovation management. How, how, how do you coin this category of things? I would say it's like agile for startups in the beginning, and now it's more and more turning into um, like fighting or dealing with complexity in bigger corporations? What, what's, what's the category term? Yeah, well, I don't know. It, it's hard to categorize. So I, I am about thought leader for? <laughs> <laughs> for teaching large enterprises how to act like startups again. OK. So large companies are, obviously, we've heard a lot about it. You know, the disruption, globalization, uh, customers have this massive amount of choice now. There's not sort of the brand loyalty that there used to be, so customers can jump from one vendor to another. So it's, uh, companies are finding themselves in a pretty tough situation where the product life cycle for their products that generate most of their income, their billions in revenues, it's, it's either about to decline or it's starting to decline or it will soon mm -hmm. decline, and they need to replace all of that revenue. They need to find new markets. They need to find new ways to grow. And they can't just execute to do that. And, and yet they become these massive execution engines, which is great. That's got, to, got them where they are. But now they have to figure out how to act like a startup again in order to go out and discover new value that they can create and, and generate new revenue and new growth. And a very good example when we were in a restaurant like a couple of minutes ago, when you said, like, uh, imagine you're in a big company, and now one of your products, probably not the only one, and not. But one of the products has been disrupted. So right. there is some new technology that is simply better, cheaper, faster, whatever the customer wants. And now you're still the market leader, but you're seeing that product and looking at it, you know that you'll die, or at least like the product that you have that is leading uh, tech is dying. And now you have to do to do something. And I think think for some sorts of uh, industries or for probably most of the industries that we could come up with, we could already point them to such an incident that yeah. already happened. So yeah. I would assume that most people who are, for example, a, in a big enterprise, they know for their own business already what that type of disruption could be. It's not that it's far. The, the smartphone just came out. The internet just was introduced, and we, someone, a weirdo would tell you, oh, someone could be good in logistics, and it's, it's this Jeff guy, and he could sell CDs and books. And I would say, yeah, yeah, Jeff Bezos, the guy with this bell that rings whenever um, he gets a new order. Um, do you think every industry has this fear already, or is there other protected industries that like complexity doesn't hit them. Yeah, I, still I, like those big companies. Mostly, they are very efficient, right? Right. So they know how to do this at a very low cost. Yeah. Listen, there's some industries out there that are still just 
just raking in the dough, right? I mean, there's uh -huh. still industries that they can forecast for quite a bit out into the future uh -huh. that their revenues are going to be healthy. So they don't have the same imperative to change. I think that they're still looking at this stuff, and, and still those companies will start innovation labs, and they'll start looking, well, maybe we should start thinking about business models that are maybe they'll exist five years from now. So there are companies that are, they don't have the imperative to act now, but more and more every year, he's got, something is taking away chunks of revenue that they didn't predict. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, it's kind of a hot topic right now, people figuring out how to do this. So you are obviously someone to talk to when I'm in such a situation. What do you, what do you tell people? What can you tell people who are watching this video? And what actions would you recommend to, to be doing? So yeah. I'm, I'm in that shoe now, and it hurts. Well, so the, the, the toughest part about it is that uh, I think what the leadership feels first is we need to move faster. Mm -hmm. You know, that everything that we do inside of our organization takes too long. So even if we go out and we understand our customers, by the time the, the needs that we've identified are translated into a product specification. That's already out there with someone else. Right, it's already out there. Or by the time it gets to the product specification to then the product actually being launched, it's too late. Do, do you know what, what, when I was, there were always people who told me that they had told everyone for years that this is going to be happening. So something would happen, I don't know, the internet would come up or whatever. And they would tell me, I was telling everyone like this would happen or this song would come up. And it's like, this is like, it was always a very bad feeling for me, both for them and also for me, like, who cares? Right. Like, who cares if you now know that this is going to be a successful product if it's not your product? Right. Like you can, Congratulate, pat yeah, them on the back, yeah. or whatever. But right. if they are like, invading your industry, <laughs> not so good. Right. Um, yeah, but so so. so okay, we, we want to go faster. We want to really faster. Actually, what what I'm saying is, I think that's the feeling yeah, you get, though. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you boil it down, it isn't just faster. You know, you were you and I were talking about agile, mm -hmm. and there's the agile methodology and the principles, and and that's part of it. But fundamentally, agile means. I've received new information. How do I actually change the course of my business based upon that new information? Mm -hmm. So the example I like to give, you know, your Nokia, 2009, the iPhone's already been out for two years. A year ago, Apple opened up the App Store to third-party developers. Now the iPhone is a platform, right? And just rocket ship, right? And your Nokia, 2009, and you're still making the same phones that were in your business plan in 2005. Yeah. Right? So that's like fundamentally the lack of agility. So how do we take incorporate new information and change our processes based upon that new information? So this this brand, at least in my perception, has been hit so hard that um, do you know the company with things? They're creating um, devices that you can use to track yourself, your sleep. They have a uh, weighing device. What do you call it? Way. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, blood pressure, uh, temperature, and everything will go into uh, an app that they have. And you can also have an Apple Health or Google Health or whatever. Right. And this company has just been bought by Nokia. Yeah. It's now called Nokia Health. I said, oh, the, the first thought I had when I when I figured actually the, the app just changed. I said, what was it? Oh, what is it called Nokia? And I know I was digging that up. And then the first thought I had is should I buy new uh, like uh, devices because they will break? Uh, and then it's like, actually, wait a minute. Why should this company be able to to pull this up? But like it, they, uh, they, as you said, like they they made a very big mistake. That, they did. You know, but if you look where the company actually started, they've gone through a number of huge major transformations. They did tires in right. the beginning. Yeah. 150 or, years or something. I don't even know if it was tires, I don't remember, but just huge transformations. So they've done it in the past. But the, but just to me that was a fundamental example of and really you could point to RIM in, in Canada as well, where the disruption has already happened. And that's not just a small market change, that's a huge market change. Yet 
yet because of the internal structure and processes of these businesses, they're not able to but change their plans. Let me call you out on this. Okay. My question was, what am I going to do? And now you gave me this example of the, the company who's screwed up. What? Well, I would, what I was doing was defining agile. So that's what we want to be able to become is be, is be agile. And so the way we actually teach that is by identifying people inside the organization that are on, are sort of already act entrepreneurial. So what we, the way we talk about this is that we want to bring an entrepreneurial spirit into the enterprise. Mm -hmm. We don't want to put them in a lab silo. That's an okay place to start. But what we really want is everybody inside the company needs to adopt some part of this mm -hmm. entrepreneurial spirit. And, and again, the way I look at it is across the company you have a continuum a spectrum of uncertainty. So inside of your core business, you may have very small amounts of uncertainty based upon the strategic priorities that you're trying to achieve. And uh, so maybe you know 95% of how you're going to achieve your objectives, but there's still this 5% gap of uncertainty. And then over five years from now, where your revenue is going to come from, maybe there's lots of uncertainty. And so you want to act like an entrepreneur wherever there's uncertainty. And, and the way we define acting as an entrepreneur, we call it the three E's of lean innovation. Empathy, understanding our customers deeply. Experiments, so running with a discipline, running purposeful built experiments to validate or invalidate our core assumptions. And then the third E is evidence. We're gonna use data plus insights that we gather in order to make decisions rather than just what our conviction is or our pet project or what our hopes and dreams are. We're going to use goals, evidence. personal goals. Exactly. Oh, no, I'm, I'm doing that. Yeah. Hitting your computer. Um, <laughs> and so we're going to teach. We're going to teach people not only how to apply those in the real world, but where to apply them inside the organization in order to benefit the company today and also to lay the foundation of growth three years out, five years out. That's interesting. I, I didn't know that that you had operationalized this so much. So empathy, ex experiments. And the third, I already forgot. Evidence. Uh, evidence, okay, insights, data. Um, we should iterate on that. Um, but before we do that, um, about the lab, I know a couple of people who are pretty popular in Germany for thinking publicly about complexity, how to deal with that in big enterprises. Um, Lars Vollmer, uh, Niefling, for example, you probably don't know them. Yeah. They don't, they don't uh, publish in English. So one of the things that Lars does often is he calls out those innovation labs as like a business theater. He says like this is this is not going to change anything. You said um, you can do it. it. Was like you. My impression was you acknowledge that it could be a tool to help them achieve this, and then you yeah. said like everyone needs to change a little. Right. Or uh, if I'm now like in this corporate leader shoes in a very big, uh, big company. Would you do this lab because it's easy? This is easy to pull off. Like you could just separate a couple of people and then say, look, go and innovate. Yeah, to, be, um, to be perfectly honest with you, no. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. But I also recognize that there's a lot of companies that started that way. And so if they have started that way, we can help. We can leverage that. Yeah. So we have started with those innovation groups, but what we end up doing is we we help them drive some sort of small impact. So instead of that will inspire the others to right. So then you move it into the core business, which is by the way, also, it's it's kind of what they had in mind in the first place, right? It is. Um, what Lars says is it's impossible, but um, uh, however, so. This would be like if you are in such a lab, in such an innovation group in your company, then it's probably smart to not only think about these three E's, but uh, Brian Cooper. Um, okay, is there an alternative to that? Like, well, so, so we have a program that we call 100 Startups in 100 Days. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of that program is, and this is really for only the most bold and audacious out there, is that we're going to show you, and we'll actually work with you, to launch 100 internal startups in 100 days. Almost guarantee you you're going to start finding impact inside of that. Because we're going to tackle not only customer-facing issues, but we're going to tackle internal process issues. So in other words, we can go to senior leaders and go, what are some of your biggest uncertainties 
that are, you're facing this year. That really sounds bold. Did, did you do that already? Is, did it, is, it, is that something that companies do? It's, it sounds like a very risky thing, like to have my whole, I, I, I like the idea a lot. It's, right. uh, but it's not, it's not, they it's say not really, stop working at all. No, it's uh, not really risky, mm -hmm. because what we're actually tackling is the uncertainty of the business. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's risky. So it's of, kind of 100 big experiments? Yep, I mean, exactly right. Mm -hmm. There are 100 experiments that we're going to run inside that company. Which is a good um, uh, way to start the first B experiments. No, empathy was the first one. Uh, let's do experiments first. Okay. Is, is there a plan or does it, does it ruin your... Let's, let's start with empathy. You... Anywhere you want to go. But okay. yeah, empathy's fine. But so everybody inside of a, of, a, of a company has a customer. Could be an internal customer. So mm -hmm. we need people to think that way. HR, finance, legal compliance, IT. Think of the, the groups that you're serving inside the company. Those are your customers. So that's how we can tackle internal uh, issues as well as external ones. So the first job is to go in and develop empathy for the customer. Empathy does not mean go ask your customer what they want and do what they say. It's about understanding what are the drivers, what are the needs, what are the problems, what are the passions, what are the aspirations. It's learning about what work, what what where what the environment is that your customer is working in, and, and what's good about that environment and what's not. It, it, it's interviewing them, but it also could just be observations. Um, there's also these other techniques in order to, uh, for, for, for the, your customers to help prioritize what their needs are. Um, but you're trying to understand them deeply. It doesn't mean that you have to go hug your customer. It doesn't have to be this big emotional bonding thing. Mm -hmm. But you really do need to understand what their aspirations are. People inside a business uh, B2B type of companies often say, well, just make rational decisions. And it's not true. It's just human beings are making these decisions, no matter whether it's B2C or B2B. And so we need to understand what it is that's driving these people's decision making. Um, when you're saying that, I, what I'm hearing is being a little more humble. Uh, like a lot of people, like especially, I don't know, a lot of people that I meet that are very senior in the company and they know how shit is done. They, they sometimes lack like this empathy. That's right. That should you just like look at what do they really need? Right. And, yeah. Okay. So it's not sales mode. We're not. We're not pushing a solution at this point. Mm -hmm. We're just learning. We're listening, learning, asking probing questions. Can you give questions. me one like action that people actually do when you're doing this empathy thing? Like they say, okay, I I should be developing more. Empathy with my people. How do I do that? Right. So what do, you do with so here's a, here's a really basic technique, right? Mm -hmm. So I call it flipping the conversation. So I can say, so Martin, I'm Grant Cooper. I work with large enterprises. I try to bring an entrepreneurial spirit to large enterprises to establish companies. When I talk to senior leaders like you, what I often hear from them is that the company is just moving too slowly. That we're not close enough to our customers to understand what their real needs are that we build solutions that they don't actually want. Do you face any of those, those problems? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm talking very little about myself. I have three assumptions of problems that you might face, and then I can just ask you straight up whether you face them. What are the likely responses? Nope, I don't face any of them. And I'll go, congratulate you, you run an awesome business. You're not my customer. Do you know anybody else that might, might face those problems? Second. The uh, answer might be, well, yeah, I kind of face those, but here's my big problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can address it, maybe you can't, but at least you know what the priority is of these other problems. Or third, you can get it totally, especially that customer one. Right? People don't talk to the customer. So, so you're, that's a, then a point to dive in. So now I've, I've already got you admitting that there's something that you're facing there, and I can ask you more probing questions, and now you're talking about what are the issues that are keeping you up at night. Mm -hmm. so just that simple flipping the conversation is a great first way to go out and learn how to. Get so I it. don't tell you what I can do so awesomely, but rather put out some assumptions on that you and tell me whether this is something that you find interesting. Yeah, yeah that's uh, I understand that. <laughs> okay, now uh, experiments. I I love that. Um, it's been even for us, and we're a 150 people company. Um, it's been or is still a ride to try to implement 
doing experiments in a way that learning actually happens. It's, it is freaking difficult in my opinion to, to do. Like um, the first thing that I see in Germany a lot is people say, oh, we're, we're making no experiments in here. Like we're way too big and too professional to do experiments. That's one problem that I see. Would want to know from you how you tackle this. Like experiments are bad. You must have a plan. You must have prepared. You must have done your homework, and then you can explain. Why don't we just start with that problem? Well, I mean, so to me, it's like, well, what do you mean by doing your homework? I mean, to me, the experiments is the homework. So, in other words, what we're trying to do is is break down. So, so after you do the empathy work. You're not doing what the customer tells you they want. You're understanding why they're asking. And then it's up to you as the entrepreneur or the innovator or the product person to come up with the idea, right? We're responsible for the idea. And then what we want to do is apply the experiments in order to have rigor against the idea, not just accepting the idea as being true because we dreamed it up. So what is the riskiest assumption about our ideas? That's what we're trying to drive for and when we teach experimentation. We'll brainstorm what are the all of the assumptions. What has to be true for this solution to work for that customer? And we'll we'll prioritize, find the riskiest assumption, and now we're gonna run an experiment against that riskiest assumption. So how to get leaders to run experiments against risky assumptions? That's a it's a a tough question, right? It's uh this is why we do it in our sprints, because we want to get them through a bunch of cycles and we actually do special workshops just for leaders mm. because we want them to expose their assumptions and we want them to see that that some of their assumptions are going to be wrong and we're hoping that they get that aha moment that wait a second all my assumptions aren't correct my plan isn't foolproof yeah so we kind of have to show that to them so that they see it themselves before they believe it so this is something where like in our business, and we're working a lot of, with software that people use to, to get this agility and so on. It's, at this point, I, I often become pretty rude to people and say, look, it's just like you're living on a rock. Like you, just, like you have to accept that complexity has surpassed you like a couple of years ago. Yeah. You probably didn't, <laughs> didn't find out. And, like you have to experiment because it's the only way you learn without losing a lot of money. Right. And, and the problem with, with that is, like, at least in Germany, and I think it's the same uh, thing for the US, um, a lot of things are sequential. They are this waterfall type of things. Like if you, for example, you're in school, and then there's a test, you can't go in and say, oh, I'm going to see how good I do. And if I don't do, I'll, I'm going to learn a little, little bit more. And I'll learn from the, the yeah. others. You'll just get a bad grade. And then in the end of the year, you'll probably maybe not pass uh, or whatever. So you do have to prepare. And you, you do have to be spot on. Um, at this point, you, you need to pull the following knowledge. Right. And it's the same. Like If you're going in a keynote, that's not an experiment. Like this right. is like this one thing where right. then those three hundred people will listen to you. Right. And a lot of things. Uh, if you're pulling out this iPhone from the the package and turn it on, like it simply has to work. Yeah. It's not that. That's not an experiment. That's, that's right. not like that's not an iteration. And a lot of things still in this world don't work this way, and people do have trouble to to understand that Apple probably had like. 10,000 people pull up the sleeve already, right. finding out how they like it and how they like the sound and all of this. And then yeah. they learn that, obviously, this is not the right thing to do. Right. And uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's got to be a, uh, we have to invent a new term for a reasoning fallacy that somehow when we see things after the tipping point where they massive mm -hmm. amounts of success, we lose sight of all of the work yeah. that was done to get the you know to get to that tipping point, and, and you also don't see the other people who also like did right all of the slightly as good but didn't make it right through. the graveyard right yeah. mm -hmm. we see the the we see the the one that's living not all of the 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 attempts that are in the graveyard so I think that the the yeah it's pretty tricky the 
you know, we, we just want to expose those assumptions and the way we prioritize is based upon what is actually known versus unknown. And so you're right. If it's known, you're not running an experiment. You don't need to run an experiment in the unknown. So we're just trying to find those assumptions where there's no market evidence for what we believe in. And then we can run these experiments in order to validate or invalidate those assumptions. And then we can know whether there are things that we have to change a different market segment, change the product, scrap the idea altogether before, as you said, before you spend a bunch of money because you wrote a plan in a particular way. So um, let's use some of this time for you to teach me more about experiments. So we're running these experiments now, and we're even formulating hypotheses. Okay. Okay, we think we're doing this because this and that. And at this point in time, we assume that we'll have these and these measurable results. And so often we also come up with qualitative, like Brand came to me and said, this webinar was so cool. And this is also something I would be putting the hypothesis. Still, we don't. I, I don't have the feeling that we are very professional in that yet. Mm. Like we miss the the dates to check, or for some things they go sideways. So they're not a complete failure. They just turn from an experiment into a routine because they prove somewhat. No one will ever like question like what what was the hypothesis about that? Mm. Like, it's just like and. We, it's just like yesterday I, I looked at this wiki page in our conference and I told them like I want a new marketing hire to go through this list and learn something because we've invested like tons of money and I see people coming up with the same old shitty um, <coughs> suggestion. And the only fact that I have done this experiment already is helping I'm not doing it again. Although we already have the evidence, right. no, one, no one can see it. So do you have like a blueprint or a template? Or how do you how do you make sure that this company, when it now does these experiments, actually learns as a company, documents them in the I right way? That's, that's sort of an unsolved problem out there, I think. So there are some software companies out there that are trying to help with that. Lean Launchpad is one mm -hmm. where you're tracking the results of experiments and tracking the insights. And, and hopefully that becomes a, a repository of of, yeah, this experiment was run, and here are the results. Um, that should be public, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, so it should be, this should be public. I mean, Lean. Glider is the name of the software product, G-L-I-D-R. Glider. So if you are interested in that, like me, you'll put that down now. And, and you check can, out Glider. You can contact me, and I can put you in Yeah, by the way. And, people, and so. you can book a keynote, a workshop. Oh, no, I was just uh, <laughs> that, only with respect to Glider. I'm happy to put you in touch with those with those people there. They're a partner of ours. So, uh, so I think that there's some challenges with 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 tracking all of that stuff too, because it's a lot of uh, a lot of data entry. But I think that the 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 real tough part is people want to run experiments on the known because they they already can predict the results. And so there's sort of a, like a lack of self-awareness and self-honesty when they're choosing whether they should be running an experiment or not. Mm -hmm. So in other words, people, you know, we're prioritizing assumptions based on known and versus unknown, and they can talk themselves into, well, we don't really know this, even though the mark the company does have that intelligence. Yeah. And uh, and so there should be an end period for experiments, where you're evaluating based upon the data. You know, how long does it take? Well, it depends, right? It's the, yeah. it depends on the assumption. It depends on the business. It depends on who your customers are. Is it software? I mean, there, it, what what would you stand at as about running experiments? Forty two years. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know the number. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, forty-two. The answer is always forty-two. Yeah. No, okay. really. It's, so it's let just... me let me try to to share something of what we standardize. So what we standardize is we always want to have some measurable thing, anything. Yeah. Like you could have this excuse of this is uh, like so complex and it doesn't make sense to to measure. I'm, I'm doing a lot of marketing, so people will always come up with things like. Uh, Leads or 
offers we created or whatever. Um, but often things are so basic that you can get to this point, and uh, then we would come up with some. Someone said something, or we got positive okay. feedback on that. So that something measurable. So I have, a, I, have a, in always. I have a value stream framework. So a customer journey from first becoming aware of a product to becoming passionate about a product. Mm -hmm. Seven states. Mm -hmm. So this is a way to bucket uh, experiments and data yeah. around different phases mm -hmm. that the customer is in. So the phase is something that you would put in. Right. So if 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 it's the product itself, then what I'm saying is this market segment, in order for this market segment to demonstrate that they're receiving the value that I've promised them, this is what their behavior is. They log on, they upload a video, and they share it to 10 friends once a week. Mm -hmm. If they don't do that, they're not a satisfied customer, and I have to either improve the product or I have to re-engage that customer in a different way in order to make them satisfied. So that's very specific metric around satisfaction, one phase of that customer. Passion, right? a passionate customer, is maybe somebody that does five videos a week or sends it out to 1,000 people or um, includes a viral loop in their videos in order to help them go viral. And maybe it has to be that one of their videos has gone viral, but they're working towards making it. So there's a bunch of other things that they have to mm -hmm. be doing on a regular basis that tells me that that customer is a more engaged customer than the one I've identified as satisfied. Those are product focused, but you can look at anywhere along the marketing yeah, and sales exactly funnel. Awesome. Uh, but so but now I'm going to run experiments based upon where's my bottleneck to growth. So if I double the number of people that get from uh, intrigued in the product to actually trusting the company, if I double that number, I know that I'll get the double number of passionate customers because I know what my conversion methods are along mm -hmm. that whole yeah. state. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm just thinking what, what, what else do we have? We always have a dating when we want to check, um, which we don't comply, but <laughs> at least it's there. Yeah, at least it's there. I hope we, we're going to be, uh, be better at it. And it's also a timing issue, right? You have yeah. to devote some time on these experiments yeah. formalities, otherwise you'll never be able to to assess later if you have hit your expectations or not. Well, it could be number of customers if it's not time. It could be number of customers that have, have interacted with the experiment. And yeah. that depends upon your how big yeah. your market yeah, is. Yeah, that's right. Right? Um, and again, when you're checking in. But still, you'll have to have a date. Because if the number is so low, yep. the just threshold doesn't right. kick in. Right. And you'll sometimes have to say, oh, oh experiment yeah. failed, right. kick it. Well, it could be, so the way we look at the, the results of the experiments, either pivot because the assumption was wrong, and so now you have to change something fundamental. Persevere, which means the, the, the assumption was actually true, and so now you can go on to a, another assumption along the value stream. Do you have a, or the third is iterate. This experiment here just isn't generating conclusive enough evidence. So what do I need to do to modify or improve the experiment Relaunch it in order that that experiment doesn't just continue to generate vague data. It's how can I make the experiment better so that we're getting to either yes or no. Let's uh, talk about persevere for a moment. So I find out my experiment was successful. What happens to the media is actually I don't know. Like people know this is successful, so we'll somehow figure out to make this experiment a routine. Because it's working, but there's no process for that. Mm -hmm. It's just like it's some kind of. If, you, if you'd ask me, like, how do you do that? It's like, I don't know. Someone pulls it off. Someone out of nowhere takes the energy to say, like, I'm gonna implement that now. Yeah. So, so you know, we've been we've been trying to tackle that problem by integrating, integrating, but keeping as a separate separate swim lane experiments from regular product development in the agile process. Mm -hmm. So that the experiments is is are are you know we coded experiments. We're going to show those to a fraction of our traffic. For example, a fraction of our existing customers are only going to see this experiment, and then based upon the results, we decide whether it goes into the main the main tree or not, or whether if it fails, it's it's out. Mm -hmm. So that way. When a, an experiment succeeds, it actually has to go. Yeah. That like action has to be taken. It has to be moved into yeah. the main. I actually I learned something like uh, the the analogy or 
metaphor of software development where you branch out and then you can go back and, and master with your branch is, is pretty powerful. Yeah, OK. So um, experiments. There's a lot of things. Uh, obviously, you still have uh, questions that you can solve yourself that's uh, alleviating to some point because we're actually really struggling in making this a company-wide thing, not just like some some small fires burning here right. and there. Yeah. Um, um, coming to the third E, I only uh, remember data and insights. What, what was the E stand for? Well, the E is the evidence. Evidence. Right. Evidence, OK. Um, how do I get the data? I Like this big data thing in total is, for me, my, my biggest impression is I often look at data and don't get any insights from that. Right. So I'm overwhelmed with big data. There's a very good book, book on that, like where um, the author says that, the, in his opinion, the biggest uh, value in big data is that you can drill down so that you only see like, like exactly the people you want to see, and you can only do it because you have so many. Where do I get it? How do I leverage it? What, what, do, you, what do you do with a customer well, so these enterprises do have data normally, right? Right, but I don't, even, I don't even consider the data that we're talking about as being big data. I'm talking about the results of the experiments. I'm talking about looking at that engagement number for, the, for satisfaction. That's mm -hmm. what I'm evaluating. I'm not evaluating everything else. Okay. So for each decision point, you should only be looking at two or three pieces of data. The key is... So this is relying on the other show. Right. Yeah. Right? So this is, and, and plus I also want the insights. So I'm not going to separate, I'm not going to look at data over here and insights over here. Because when I'm running experiments, I'm going back to the customer and I'm learning from them why did they behave in the way that they did. So the whole purpose of the experiment is the experiment relies on customer to behave in a particular way. So if you just go do interviews and you ask your customers, would you do this or would you pay for that, you can't really believe them. So what we want to do is ask customers how they've behaved in the past to learn about them. And then we run experiments to show how they will behave. And then we're going to look at that, ask them why they behaved in order to sort of verify that we understand them. And so that's what I'm going to look at. Can you give a real example um, of where you pull up this data thing where you had like Results of experiments you could then use to. I, you want a non-digital example? Possibly. Or so well, or I, mean, I think that the, I think that the non-digital some, sometimes brings it forward. What we mean by experiments. So we were working with a hospital group, and in this particular hospital, this is kind of scary. But in this particular hospital, doctors and nurses uh, in the in sort of the patient area were not washing their hands often mm -hmm. enough. And the way they were measuring this is they were literally standing at the sink with a clipboard and a piece of paper and writing down the doctor's name or the nurse's name every time they wash their hands. And it's just, just absurd. Um, and so this hospital team, this is not software engineers, this is a hospital so team. So they would watch them from their backs? Or how, what, because normally, if I was a doctor and came in, I would wash my hands because I would know I they watch me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would think, except that you're seeing a bunch of customers or, or patients. So are you actually coming over and washing your hands often enough type of thing? Yeah. <laughs> but so that, this team from the hospital decided, like, well, we need to see if we can get them to wash their hands more. Yeah. And so one of the suggestions that they had was to gamify it. So they went back to the hospital, and they tried to introduce this game that they had created to get the, the nurses to wash their hands more. And the nurses were actually really offended by it because they didn't feel like washing hands was a game. This wasn't a fun and games to them. And uh, they said, well, the reason why we don't wash our hands is there's just one sink in the corner and there's not enough, you know, there's too many people and not enough, not enough sinks. So they went back to the drawing board and they dreamt up this hand sanitizer, this atomizer that you could put your hands in this machine and you could put your hands in there for 30 seconds and it would it would sanitize your hands. Mm -hmm. and they said, no, there's no way they'll stop and put their hands in the machine for 30 seconds. And other people were saying, ah, the technology doesn't exist and we don't know if it exists. 
But we convinced them to go and run the experiment anyway. So they created a cardboard prototype and they went okay. and they went back to the hospital and they have photographs of these surgeons standing there with their hands in the box for 30 seconds. So the data is 29 out of 30 doctors were willing to stand, were willing to put their hands in this contraption for 30 seconds in order to sanitize their hands. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by data. So the, the, and you could figure out what the analogy is in the digital world, yeah. but the point is, is that in the old days, somebody would dream up that sanitizer and they would go spend a million dollars building some sort of a prototype and then assuming that doctors would actually do that. When we're running experiments, we're looking at, well, the riskiest assumption is if doctors aren't willing to put their hands in it, then it doesn't matter if yeah. it works or not. So let's go test it. So, so the point is, is to try to get people to, to behave in a way that indicates whether that assumption is true or not. Mm -hmm. And so if you're running digital experiments, it's really the same thing. It's just that you're doing it on thousands of customers. Are they willing to click on this? Are they willing to you know, go and search for this? Are they willing to upload this piece of data or this? Those are all experiments that you're running and the, the data is simply beforehand you say, if we allow people to upload their, I don't know, tax form, then 75% of the customers that reach this page will do so. Run the experiment, if you look at the data. Yeah. So basically what you say is, when I mean data or evidence, I'm talking, I'm very simplifying now. Like you have a, a checklist where you just like make your marks, and if you have enough marks, then you may be validating what your thought is. And if you find out that you have still an empty paper after, I don't know, a uh, amount of time, it's probably not that successful. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so it's very simple, like a, a spreadsheet could help, or any any form of simple script on a website, or yeah. I mean, or, but basically, you say like this behavior, and then we count how. Often people they people sh shouldn't be building digital features. People shouldn't be putting features into their product without a way of measuring whether their customers are using it. That's yeah. sort of end of story. Almost always, those are ending up in a SQL database anyway. What's so so you want to build the tool that extracts that out. But the experiment is to say up front, nine out of 10 customers will behave in this way if I implement this feature. And so I'm gonna measure that over some period of time and see how close I am to the mark that I set up beforehand. So I'll give you this 20,000 employee company. What's the most difficult thing for them to do? Is it the empathy thing? Is it the experiment thing? Is it the actually measuring and looking at the data? I Boy, what a question. Yeah, I think it's all of the above, though. I think the problem is, is that we structure companies based upon the assembly line, and we're just not in the, in the industrial age anymore. We should be structuring companies around that value stream. One product group should be own a whole value stream from awareness to passion. Mm -hmm. And then it would be easy that all of those people inside there could get empathy and run experiments and use evidence. Instead, what we do is we build out these companies and we say, Okay, customer support people and sales people are the only ones that are allowed to talk to customers. Product people are the only ones that are allowed to run experiments. Mm -hmm. Evidence is the BEI team that sits you know, somewhere else. And so all of that stuff is it's not cohesive. It's not looking at the same objectives. It's not with the same purpose. And so part of the problem, in my opinion, is that the structure, the very structure of these companies is too old. So how do we overcome that? Well. To me, you put together teams to go solve a problem. So here, for this particular problem on this product, uh, we're gonna put together a, a product manager, a couple of engineers, a designer, a marketing person, maybe a salesperson, maybe a customer support person, and the, the job of this team is to go remove this product problem, which we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So if we don't know what it is, that means that they have to go and talk to the customers, understand why they're behaving in the way they are, run some experiments to see if they can solve whatever bottleneck that exists in that part of the value stream. Awesome. Brian Cooper, Move the Needle is uh, the name of your company. Um, how can our customers or people view this uh, reach you? 
So I'm available at Brant Cooper pretty much everywhere. So Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and my email. And I encourage people to, to feel free to write me. It's Brant at MovesTheNeedle.com. That's B-R-A-N-T at MovesTheNeedle.com. OK, awesome. Uh, and he's obviously willing to uh, take a flight from <laughs> San Diego to Germany. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for um, having me. That's been very um, uh, interesting for me. And I learned, actually, a couple of things about experiments. And uh, I hope that you've learned also something. And um, that if you like that, you'll contact uh, Brent in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Martin.